So does anybody remember what we talked about three weeks ago when we last met? Well, aren't you guys just brutally honest this morning? Thank you. We started this new idea that evidently was extremely impactful to you. (laughs) On the idea that there's nothing you can go through that Jesus hasn't already gone through. Remember, the title was, Did Jesus Go Through That Too? And we talked about three things, rejection. He went through that. We talked about temptation. He went through that. I gave you scripture on all this. And we talked about betrayal of a good friend. And I still think that's super important. And we're going to continue on that in a couple of weeks. However, today, I think we need to step back. You know, sometimes we just need to stop and kind of evaluate where we are. I don't know about you guys, but I've been in churches when things are going on and you know something needs to be addressed and the pastor's like, well, I'm just going to preach on what I already have prepared. But sometimes the Holy Spirit's working in that. It, the Holy Spirit's working on giving the ideas for that other sermon too, but the Holy Spirit is saying, pump the brakes a little bit. Let's stop and make sure we're all good and we all understand how to deal with things, okay? So that being said, I have personally been in full-time ministry for 11 and a half years. And I have discovered that there is one thing that humans are just not good at. Anybody want to take a guess? Okay, Jeff, you have the sheet in front of you, and you still failed the test. (laughs) Jeff says communication. And you're right, that uh, humans are very bad, and we'll cover that. That'll be our third sermon series out, you know. In October. Anyone else want to take a guess? Oh, good job, guys. Conflict. We stink as humans at covering conflict. Who in here loves conflict? Nobody? Who in here is extremely comfortable addressing conflict? Nobody? Who in here feels like they biblically know how they should resolve conflicts? <laughs> We got two. Peyton raised his hand. He can't even resolve conflicts with his own brother. (laughs) Pete says prayer, and that's a good start, Pete. We're going to go a little deeper. So we have this situation where maybe two people disagree, or maybe a bunch of people disagree, and how do we handle it? What do we do? Do we go blast them? Do we sweep it under the rug? Do we act like it didn't happen? Do we just say we're supposed to love? We're supposed to love, so everything's good. How do we handle it? How do we resolve it? Because that's kind of two different things. So I was talking about humans in general. What happens when we come into the church? Is the church as a whole good at dealing with conflict? It's terrible. In fact, I think you can step outside of the church and find some people better handling conflict than we often find inside the church, if we're honest. We're going to be honest. So I'm talking about Christians, people who are Christ followers. We're supposed to know how to handle conflict, and we may be worse than, quote, the world. I mean, that's a sad statement to be able to stand up here and say, I really feel like conflict is dealt with outside in the secular world, non-Jesus following. Because remember, the church is us, the people. So I'm talking about conflict with non-Christians is often handled better than conflict within Christ followers. That is a sad, sad statement. So I know I've taught on this before, but I realize it's been a few years. So we're going to teach on biblical conflict revolution. It is revolution. Resolution. And we're going to do it for two weeks. Yeah, it's not a revolution. (laughs) It's a resolution. (laughs) Although if we could get this right, it would cause a biblical revolution in a good way. Now, here's the deal. I can't make you do it biblically, but I can teach you how we're supposed to do it. I can't even make me do it biblically all the time. The goal is I'm going to teach you how you do it, and then we're going to help support you if you need help. It's up to you what you do with this, just like every other Sunday. And see, some people are just kind of naturally better than others about handling conflicts, but some of the people that are better about handling it are harsh in their handling. 
I don't have a problem with conflict. I do, actually. But, you know, you can say, I don't have a problem with conflict, and then we're very abrasive. So you got kind of two extremes. Someone's either super comfortable with it, and they'll just come lay the hammer down. Or we're not good at it, so we just avoid the person and avoid the situation and sweep it under the rug and pretend it's not happening. Anybody with me? Where all do you guys fall? Rhetorical question. Chris, that meant don't answer. <laughs> and if that hurt your feelings, you can biblically correct me later and address it. All right, so first of all, I mean, but you guys get the point, right? We're usually very bad at this. Some people get fired up and angry so quickly. Some are afraid. But the good news is the Bible lays it out clearly. It's easy. Very little room, in my opinion, for manipulation or changing these scriptures. There are a lot of scriptures that you and I can read, and we can interpret them two different ways. The good news is these scriptures are as black and white as possible, and that's a good thing. So first, we've got to define conflict, at least for what we're going to talk about today. Because conflict, and I put some of this on your sheet there in front of you, conflict can be used to define the war going on right now with Israel and Hamas. That's a conflict. Israel is in conflict with Hamas. Ukraine is in conflict with Russia. So when two nations are at war, we can call that a conflict. That is not what we're talking about today. We are told in scriptures there will be conflicts from now until Jesus comes back. And when he comes back, there will still be conflicts because the whole thing ends with a big war. That's not what we're talking about. Conflict can just be a disagreement in your own brain. Like you can be conflicted on what to do in a situation. I have a situation in hand. Do I do this or do I do this? You can be conflicted in your own brain. We're not talking about that. You can take that to the Lord. We can apply scripture and you got to figure it out. Conflict when, can be when two people don't agree on the same idea, but it's more of an opinion thing, a thought or an idea. You know, how many husbands and wives or children have had conflicts on where to go to dinner? All the time. Again, not what we're talking about. We're not talking about where we're going to go to dinner. Well, I don't want to go there. That hurts my stomach. Well, you got to pick last time. That's not the kind of conflict I'm talking about. However, that can turn into the kind of conflict I'm talking about. So we're not talking about nations in a conflict. We're not talking about your brain in a conflict with itself. And we're not talking about opinions and thoughts and ideas conflict. We are talking about conflict when someone has wronged another person. And that's in bold in your little handout. And we're going to talk about when conflict, it, it, and, and these kind of can go together, they can be separate when our thoughts and actions don't line up with Scripture, which makes our conflict now with God. I have a lot of people come to me and they ask for biblical, what does Scripture say about this? And I give them Scripture and they go, well, I can't do that. I'm like, well, that ain't my issue, man. You just got in conflict with God. I can't forgive that person. Well, okay, God commands you to forgive so you can be forgiven. You're in conflict with God now. So you get what I'm saying? We're talking about conflict when someone's wronged someone or perceived wrong, and we're talking about conflict when we don't apply Scripture to things, therefore we're in conflict with God. And I don't think we want to admit sometimes we're in conflict with God. I just want to make sure that we're uh, defining the context of the word conflict here. Now, for the most part, we're not going to really talk about differing opinions, but I said it already kind of sometimes differing opinions out of pride and the desire to be right can turn into a wrong. So there's a lot of if and buts in here, but I hope this will be pretty clear. How many of you know that there are just times when we got to agree to disagree? Are you guys okay with that? Can there be situations in our lives where we can just say, I, I disagree with your opinion and it's okay? Parker said, as long as it's not with Peyton. I have witnessed that, so when we get to step two of the Matthew 18 model, son, we can, dis we can discuss that. But I'm going to give you an example the rapture. You can take six Christians and ask them about their opinion on the rapture and probably get six different answers and seven different I don't knows. 
and people will fight. What's this mean? Okay, good. I gave Peyton a hard time a couple of times, so now he's going to abuse me from the back, and we're going to have to. We're going to probably have to model this conflict resolution thing in real time for you. But seriously, you think about the rapture. Is there a rapture? Is that word in the Bible? Is it not? Is it at the beginning of the tribulation, before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation? Who's God taken out, the good people or the bad people? Will Christians have to suffer wrath or not? Now, we've talked about this, and you know my opinion, but do you get what I'm saying? Like, we can take that thing, and people don't have the ability to agree to disagree, and they get into huge fights over it. And it turns into the different wrong, bad kind of conflict. Because this is one of those things in Scripture, and I'm not going to teach on the rapture today. I'm just using that as, a, as an example. This is one of those things in Scripture that there's not one verse that 100% lays it out. So you realize that, all right? There's a lot of Scripture that you've got to take a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here and piece it together. It's what Jesus called stringing pearls together, if you read a book that someone I know wrote. And when you string those pearls together, you get ideas and you get instructions and you form opinions, and if I think it's a pre-tribulation rapture and Pete thinks it's a post-tribulation rapture, it's okay. We can agree to disagree as long as there's not pride in the mix. Because part of our problem when it leads to conflict, so before we talk about how to resolve conflict, we've got to talk about what leads to conflict is pride. I am right. I've studied Scripture more than you. I can point it to you. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, you're wrong. Is that not what we do? Maybe our words don't say it that harshly, but that's what we do. I had lunch with a young man or coffee recently, and he asked me my opinion on the rapture. And I gave him a lot of scriptures. I gave him my stance, and he said, well, I could agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong, which is ironically something we joke about a lot in our family. What did I see right there? He has no desire to agree to disagree. He took my stance and immediately told me, I am opposed to you. You are wrong. That's pride. But I let him explain his side. And at the end, I said, hey, man, my goal is not to convince you. You asked me my stance, and I just simply laid out Scripture for you in the way I understand it. Um, and it's okay. Like, I don't have to convince you that I'm right. And, and your argument doesn't convince me. That you're right, and that's okay. We can agree to disagree. And if I'm right, we'll high-five on the way up, you know, when we get raptured, when we get raptured, as I believe. Or if I'm wrong and an Antichrist figure shows up in the rebuilt temple and starts saying he's God and stops sacrifices, I got to know scriptural enough to go, hey, I was wrong. We better buckle up. It's about to get real bad. So in other words, some of these things we're going to read about in Scripture or some opinions that we have, we won't know until it happens. We can form an opinion. We can have a stance, but we need to be willing to agree to disagree. Is everybody okay with that? Can you agree to disagree with somebody? Monica's shaking her head. She can agree to disagree. How about everybody else? Can we agree to disagree? And I'm covering something like this because it's just an example where two Christians can get so vehemently opposed to each other that you don't ever see each other again. And it's part of the reason we have so many different denominations. I was listening to a random history podcast this week about the biggest civil war in, Europe, in, in England's history that I didn't even know existed, and it was all over denominational splits. Millions of people died in a civil war in the 1600s or whenever it was because of disagreeing on Scripture. Boy, I read where Jesus said that. Go out and kill the people that disagree with Scripture. That is not what he said. But this is something that has plagued mankind since Jesus went to heaven. So I'm just trying to help you understand that sometimes we've got to be willing to agree to disagree. We don't have to agree on everything. We can stay out of conflict, but sometimes when we can't agree to disagree that turns into conflict and it turns into hurt so maybe that step one is just making sure that hey is this something i can just agree to disagree and walk away i don't have to be hurt by the conversation so we're going to focus 
when someone's wrong to another person, when our actions and thoughts don't line up with Scripture. But before we dive into the Scripture, i got one more thing. Do you understand there's a difference between a personal conflict and a church conflict? If you don't, I need you to understand that. We're going to cover that today. Sometimes there's a one-on-one conflict. A person has hurt me. And sometimes there is a person is hurting the whole body conversation. Those are two separate things. And I'm making that clear because I don't want Scripture about one to be turned into Scripture about the other one and then the person giving the Scripture being accused of manipulation. Simple instructions from Jesus. That's the beauty of this. Matthew 18. Anybody ever heard of the Matthew 18 model? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Matthew 18 model. How many of you do it every time you address conflict? So a few hands went up of understanding what the model is, and a few less hands went up when I said, do you use it? So Jesus gives us a model in Matthew 18, starting in verse 15, and it's so simple. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. We're going to call that step one. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out that offense. If the other person listens and confesses that you have won that person back. This would be a good time to kind of pause and say, when you go into a conflict, resolution, meeting, discussion with someone, what's your goal? Is your goal to be right? Is your goal to convince them because we're back to pride and you can't agree to disagree? (laughs) Or is your goal to seek resolution? Is your goal to seek restoration of a relationship? That's the assumption here. Jesus is saying you're trying to restore a relationship. You're trying to restore a friendship. You're trying to seek reconciliation, not prove yourself, okay? So step one was if another believer sins against you, you go privately and point out that offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back. You're done. That's it. The person says, I'm sorry. You're right. I wronged you. You're done. Restorations happen. So simple. But apparently it's not that easy because he goes on to the next step. What would you say, Pete? Pete said it. It's never that simple. Therefore, Jesus gave us step two, verse 16. But if you were unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. That's step two. Verse 17, if the person still refuses to listen, so apparently we got some hard-headed people Jesus knows we're going to come in contact with, now you take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a what? A pagan. Do you, do you, do you understand that you're not supposed to hang out with pagans? <laughs> you're not supposed to kill them, but you're not supposed to hang out with them either. Treat them as a pagan or as a corrupt tax collector. So tax <laughs> corrupt tax collectors are really bad. That'd be like saying treat them like a snaky used car salesman. No offense if anyone in here is in the car business. <laughs> Verse 18, I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Different topic for a different day, but we got power with what we do in the name of Jesus. Forbid it on earth is forbidden in heaven. Or whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. There's a little deeper thing going on here. If you allow conflict to continue on earth, it's continuing somewhere. That's not good. You you have the right to stop it on earth. Different discussion, different day. Verse 19, I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. He's talking about resolution, conflict resolution. You agree, you want to resolve it, God is going to do it. For where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I am there among them. All right, a lot to unpack. I've already kind of started, but just to be clear, first of all, this is person-to-person conflict. This is person to person. I'll pick on you, Pete. Say I wronged Pete. I hurt him. This is how he's supposed to come to me. This is not Pete did something that involved everyone in here. This is one-on-one. And Pete would never be mad, so I'm sorry I picked on you for that example. This is about a person to person. Now, it can be in the church, 
But this is specifically about a person to person. And Jesus says step one is if another believer sins against you, go privately. And notice the word. It says that they sin against you. So the first thing is that we got to step back and say, was, is what I'm upset about, was it sin? If someone says, Jason, I don't like your style of preaching, so I'm going to go somewhere else. That's not necessarily sin against me. That's their opinion. Now, if they go posting all over the Internet false things about me and telling me I'm a terrible pastor, now they accused me, slandered me, it just became sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like sometimes we get in conflicts that aren't sin-related. I've said it like ten different times. Sometimes it's just our opinions are different. Our styles are different. This is about if someone has hurt you, if someone has sinned against you. If you don't know if it's a sin, come ask someone you trust. We'll help you try to define if it's a sin. If you tell me you disagree with me, you didn't sin. If I tell you you're an idiot because you disagreed, I just sinned. Is that clear? If they listen and confess, you've won them back. Reconciliation. Stop. But even when we win somebody back, sometimes we're tempted to just keep telling them how wrong they were. Like someone can say, I'm sorry. Well, I'm glad you're sorry because you did this and this and this. I know people in my own life that do that, family members. But if they don't listen, so if, if they listen, they confess it, they say, I'm sorry, whatever, you stop. You're reconciled. But if they don't listen, you move to step two. Take one or two others with you to address it again. Now, my translation you have in front of you says take one or two. Other translations say take one or two witnesses. The Greek word there means literally an eyewitness. So sometimes we think, okay, I went to that person one-on-one. They didn't agree with me, so I'm going to take a random person with me to be a witness. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying take someone with you that's been an eyewitness to that sin. Oftentimes in our lives, when someone has hurt us, someone else has witnessed it. Someone else has witnessed that sin. And he is saying, take someone with you that can confirm whether or not that was sin. Let me break that down a little bit more. What if I have a difference of opinion with Pete? And I go to Pete, and Pete says, I I didn't do anything. I didn't win him back over. So now I take Monica with me to Pete, and I say, Pete, you hurt me. And I explain it again, and Monica goes, Jason, that's not sin. See, I need that witness there to help keep me accountable, but I also need that witness there to be able to say, yeah, Pete, that is sin. You following me? Step one, one one-on-one. Step two, take an eyewitness. If they still don't listen, they still don't confess, now you take it to the church. That's super uncomfortable. I have been in conflict resolution with someone before. And I've told them, have I had step one meetings with you? And they said, yes. And I said, how many? And they said, like 20. (laughs) Have I had step two meetings with you? And they said, yes. I said, how many? Like five. And I said, so now here I am sinning because I never wanted to go to step three. I don't want to hurt someone, so I don't want to take you in front of the church. So I let them get away with step one for a long time. Then I let them get away with step two for a long time of not fulfilling step two, and I never wanted to take it in front of the church. Then I decided, I said, so you got one more chance. I'm still going to give you one more chance. And they did it again. And I took them in front of the church, and I was accused of being a bad leader. That's the problem when we don't read our Bible and we don't understand. We, you're actually asking your pastor to sin if they don't take something to the church. If step one fails, step two fails, Step three has to happen. But we call that judgment and all this bad stuff. It's Jesus' words. But again, in all three, you're asking for confession. You're asking for reconciliation. You're asking for them to say, I'm sorry, to acknowledge it. But if they don't confess and you go through all three, it says treat them like a pagan. That's kind of step four. We call it a three-step Matthew 18 model. It's really a four-step. One-on-one, if they don't listen, take a witness. If they don't listen, take it to the church. If they still don't listen and don't change, treat them like a pagan. Get them out. 
Get them out of your life. How many of you are hanging around with people that have just hurt you and hurt you and hurt you and hurt you? They hurt you and hurt you and hurt you and hurt you and hurt you, whether you've done the Matthew 18 model or not, and you just still treat them like they're your best friend. Jesus says, go to them one-on-one, so don't, don't, don't skip steps one, two, and three and say they've hurt me 30 times. I'm just going to go ahead and treat them like a pagan. That's kind of what we do sometimes. Go do step one. If you need to, go do step two. Go do step three. And then get them out of your life. But Jesus has given them, I'm going to call it three strikes. There's mercy in that model. Do you understand that? Even in the model of dealing with someone who's wrong, Jesus instills mercy in the model. You get three chances to change. It's the third strike that you're out. Everybody clear on that? Because let's talk about what we normally do in the church. Not this church, because we're perfect. Wait, I did start this with this is why we're doing this, right? Yeah, that's right, okay. Something is perceived as a disagreement. So we've got to talk about it behind their back. None of y'all have ever done that, have you? We don't do that, do we? Jesus says go one-on-one when they've hurt you. We perceive. So maybe they haven't even hurt us. We just perceive we've been hurt. And we go talk about behind their back. Or we find out that we may have hurt someone by someone else telling us (laughs) because we've been talked about behind their back. Very rarely have I ever had someone come to me and say, Jason, I'm upset with you over this. It's always, hey, you know they're upset with you, right? Or you take it to the preacher because the preacher's got to deal with everything. Right? That's what we do. Or we go tell our friends. Or we get passive aggressive on social media and post some things that people know they're being talked about, but the person doesn't have the courage to come address it one-on-one. And the problem is we all know that model. But very few of us know the biblical model. We all know the model of talk behind your back. We all know the model of find out you offended someone through someone else. We all know the model of it's the pastor's responsibility to fix all the problems. But very few of us know the three or four step model, if you will, of the Matthew 18 model. But I'm going to tell you what I do, what I've experienced. It's happened many times, unfortunately. I'll have a person come to me and say, I have a problem with this person. And I'll say, well, Jesus said in Matthew 18 to go one-on-one. Have you gone one-on-one? No. Okay, go one-on-one. And they walk away, and who are they mad at? And then the second person eventually comes up to me and says, I, I think so-and-so's mad at me. And I'm like, I don't know. Have you done Matthew 18, step one? Go talk to them one-on-one. No, I haven't done that. Okay, go do it. I'm usually not the bad guy with that person. They just don't understand why they got to go address it. And and then, lo and behold, the second person goes to the first person and says, are you upset with me? And the first person goes, no. Huh. Now the pastor's got a problem with you because you just sinned by lying. And you are all laughing because you know this model. We've all done it. I've done it. I've been guilty of all three of those. (laughs) But somebody's going to think I'm talking about them. That's the way this works. I just know it. But I'm just giving examples of things I've seen over and over. When it becomes a pattern that you can talk about, there's a problem in the church. And then somebody goes, are you talking about me? Well, yeah, I'm talking about you and 17 other examples. Of course I'm talking about you. And I'm talking about myself. (laughs) But Jesus said three steps, worst case, four steps. And honestly, if I would tell you the one thing that's come against this church the most in five and a half years is this problem. It's happened over and over from March of 2019 through September of 2024. It has happened over and over and over where I encourage someone to talk to someone when they have a problem. They don't do it. They never go to step two and get a witness because I, they thought they came to me to be the witness and they're mad at me because I didn't do something. This is not a woe is me. This is a guy's, it's a problem. we got to get our arms around this. We have to understand this model, and we have to do it. (laughs) 
I want to be clear about something else, too. If a person commits a sin against me and I go to them one-on-one and I address that sin and they confess it, it's done. Six months later, they commit another sin that's different. That's not occurrence number two of the first sin. It's a separate sin. We're going to address if they do the same sin here in a minute. That's more of the church thing. So let me, I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. If a person sins and they confess it, you go to Matthew 18, model step one, they confess it, it's done. Now they go do a completely separate sin. You start the Matthew 18 model over again. It didn't become a cumulative thing. Chris, that means they add together. Sorry. <laughs> He's going to have to come address me one-on-one later for picking on him. Is everybody clear on that? We are sinful people. God himself said it in Genesis. We have these fancy words like justification and sanctification. Justification means you were made right with Jesus when you believed and started obeying him. Your sins are forgiven. You got eternal life. But then we are supposed to work every day the rest of our lives to become more like Christ. But because we're sinful humans, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to sin. So this is not like, well, Monica, you sinned once six months ago, and now you sinned a completely different sin six months later, so that's two strikes against you. That's not what it is. You handle each situation as a separate thing. If we have a pattern where someone sins over and over and you got 15 different single sins, we got a different issue and we'll move to that. That's called division. Okay, we'll get there in a minute. Everybody clear on that? Before we move forward, though, I want to go back to a verse that's often misused. You know how we just throw out fancy verses and they're misused? Read verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I am there among them. How many of us walk into a place and we say, and I'm, I'm way guilty of this. There's two people there, and we're like, well, where two or three are gathered in his name, he's there with them. So we can have church today. That is not the context of that scripture. That context of that scripture is conflict resolution. Do I have it wrong? Did I give the wrong verse? It's still on page one, I heard. I'm sorry, I don't have the notes, so. We have to understand this verse is in the context of conflict resolution. Do you understand that? This isn't two or more gathered in this room, therefore we can have church today because Jesus is with us. Let's step back. When you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit came into you and you became the holy temple and he lives inside you. Therefore, where one is gathered, he is there. You understand that? You don't have to have two people gathered to have, quote, church. This is a misused thing. It's kind of like I can do all things to Christ Jesus, and you put it on your tennis shoes, and you're going to go make the NBA. No, Paul is saying in that, we talked about it before, I've had a lot, and I've had nothing. I'm content in either situation. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. In other words, I don't care if I got a lot or a little. I rely on Jesus no matter what. That's what that scripture means. This is similar. Out of context, it's, it's used out of context always. I very rarely hear it used in context. In context, it's saying, when I have a problem with Pete and I go one-on-one, Jesus is there with me. If Pete doesn't listen and I take Monica back as my witness, Jesus is there with us. Would it change how you address conflict if you had a little mental picture of Jesus sitting in the room with you? Parker had another snide comment about Peyton. When I go sit down with someone to say, you have sinned against me, if I can picture that Jesus is there among us because his word says that, under the context of this, then it may help me be a little more loving and compassionate towards that person that I'm addressing. Does that make sense? It's kind of important. I'm not saying when someone tells you we're two or more gathered and they use it in the wrong context that you need to correct them. I'm just saying know that. Remember that. When you hear that, remember that is... He puts that at the end of a conflict resolution model. Again, you are the church. 
you have the Holy Spirit living in you if you believe in Jesus. So where one or more are gathered, Jesus is there. In conflict, where two or more are gathered, Jesus is there. Because at a minimum, you got two people one-on-one. All right, everybody good? I just want to point out, in case we've lost sight, when you start in Genesis 1, man, everything's perfect, and man screws up. And you go all the way to Revelation 22, you have a book in between of many books, many authors, many chapters, that's 100% about God being what? Restored back to his people. He desired in Genesis to be with Adam and Eve. They messed up. They introduced sin, they allowed sin, and now he can't be there with them. All the way to Revolution, Revolution, Revelation 22, we're on a new earth and God is dwelling with us. The whole Bible is a book of resolution. Restoration is probably the better word. The whole Bible is about us being restored Back to our Father and our Creator. This is just a small little piece in there where Jesus is saying, I expect you to seek restoration amongst each other, just like you're relying on my death to have restoration to the Father. If we could get our arms around, Jesus is there when I'm having that one-on-one meeting, and this is just a model of us being restored back to God, maybe it would help us go into those meetings with a heart of restoration instead of a heart of being right. John 3.16. Everybody knows this. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Why did God send Jesus? To be restored to Him, to have eternal life with Him. And the next verse is very important. But we never hear John 3, 16 and 17. 17 says, God sent a son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world. I'm just trying to make the point again that everything about this, God is about restoration. Jesus is about restoration. The Holy Spirit is trying to lead us to restoration. It's our human, sinful, prideful nature that gets in the way. If you two are going to keep laughing back there, I'm going to have to separate you. Sorry, buddy. When we seek conflict, resolution, we need to do it with a heart of restoration. Okay? If our natural evil thought is I'm right and you're wrong, that one comes really natural. It's really easy for us. You wronged me. That's pride. And we can preach on that a whole nother day. If you approach restoration with pride, biblically, you're going to quickly end up in step four, and you'll be treated like a pagan if they're doing it correctly. But if you approach restoration with humility that you're expected to and love, which we're going to talk about next week, and a desire to resolve the conflicts, then you're living out the heart of the Father. Jesus is telling us, here's the model, do it, and remember that I'm here with you while you're doing it. You're not out here on a limb, I'm with you. Because how many of you know that if you're looking for someone to be wrong, you will find something wrong every time? If you follow me every day, walk every step with me from the time I get up to the time I go to bed, you're going to find me do things wrong. I'm sorry. I'm trying my best. But you're going to find things wrong with people when you're looking for them. But flip that. If you are looking for restoration, you will more likely find restoration as well. If you're coming into it saying, I'm seeking restoration, I'm not seeking to be right. I'm seeking to live out this model. I want to be restored to you because you're my brother, you're my sister. I'm looking for things to go right. I'm not looking for things to go wrong. If I'm looking for you to be wrong, it's going to be a fight every time. We will find reconciliation every time if we we truly, 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 if we allow Jesus to be the center. And you know what? If the church could get this right, There would be no open pews in any church in America. If the church of Jesus Christ, 
not the denomination, the Church of Jesus Christ in America could start handling conflict resolution and get some reconciliation going. People will be lining up at the doors trying to get in to get that kind of love. But most people that don't go to church now that have been in church don't go to church because they were hurt by someone in the church. And I'll bet you $1,000 if you sat down and said, did you ever do Matthew 18? They'd say, no. I took it to the preacher. He didn't do anything about it. So I can't follow a man like that. Okay? I haven't found that one in Scripture, but when you do, let me know, and you can come back. We won't treat you like a pagan. But this is assuming that two people love Jesus and both want reconciliation, right? It said if another believer sins against you. If your family member is a heathen and a pagan already, (laughs) this reconciliation model probably won't work (laughs) because they don't have the heart of the Father in them. Does that make sense? We're assuming here that two people love Jesus, two people want reconciliation, because there was something going on at that time. Those people actually loved each other, and they loved community. Do you you understand it was kind of a threat to be cut off from the community back then? And today, we don't care. If a church tells us you're not living out biblical things, you're not welcome here, they just go, who cares? There's six or 700 more churches in Blount County I can go to. It'll take me years to burn all those bridges. But in this time, there was one church, and if you got cut off, that was devastating. So we have to remember, things are a lot different right now. These people desired reconciliation. They desired the community. Do we even desire it? I know you guys do. I'm just talking about the church as a whole and how far we've gotten from this. Okay, so let's flip. What if we're talking about division in the church? Because that was one-on-one. You hurt me. Now, what if we're talking about someone's sin, which can be one-on-one, also is creating division in the church? I've got good news. We have a model for that, too. Paul gave it to us. If you thought Jesus' model was tough because it's three strikes and you're out, get ready for Paul's because it's a little tougher. Titus 3, 10 through 11. Anybody ever read Titus? Anybody ever? I mean, it's just a book we don't even read hardly. It's kind of like James and Jude and all those. Titus 3, 10 through 11. If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and a second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth, and their own sins condemn them. Did you hear what Paul just said? If you're not willing to seek reconciliation and you're creating divisions in the church, you've turned away from the truth of Jesus. You can say you're a Christian, but your life living out is saying you're not. So, Paul, I mean, Jesus gave you a three strikes and you're out model, and Paul says in church division, it's two strikes and you're out. It's a little more harsh. If people are causing divisions among you, give one warning, then give a second one, then have nothing to do with them. The problem is, again, with this model, is the church today tolerates division. The church today tolerates sin. The church today justifies sin by the grace of Jesus. And the church today tolerates gossip. It does. Tolerates it. Jesus says, three strikes, you're out. If it's one-on-one, you're gossiping about me. I got an issue, I go to you. Three strikes, you're out. Paul says, if you're doing it in the whole church, it's causing division, meaning it's causing some divisiveness. Two strikes and you're out. Now, what we're going to pick up next week is a completely different discussion because today was about laying out the models. Next week is about how do we treat people while we're going through the models? How do we treat people that get to step four or step three? Can you love someone even if you treat them like a pagan? Say you go through all three steps of Jesus' model one-on-one, and now you get to step four, you've got to treat them like a pagan. What does that mean? Do you shoot them, stab them? kick them in the face, cuss them out as they're leaving, ignore them. We can answer those questions about as good as we can. I mean, you know you don't kill them or stab them, hopefully. But sometimes we can't answer these questions any better than we can about what the conflict model looks like. So after today, you can no longer say you've never been taught about how to handle one-on-one conflict with a believer, and you can say you, you cannot say you've never been taught how to handle divisions in the church among the believers. 
But next week, we're going to pick back up on how we treat people as we go through Jesus' model, how we treat people as we go through Paul's model. But before we leave today, as we process through this, I'm going to make one last point. I've already kind of said it, already really said it, but all this hinges on the fact that you want to be in restoration, reconciliation. It all hinges on the fact that it would bother you to be cut off. You would be devastated to not be able to come back into that community of believers. They were being killed back then for being believers. They needed each other. This is one case where the church of 2024 has gotten so comfortable. You, you didn't like that I sinned against you. I don't really care because I'll go to this church down here that's bigger, and I'll just fit in with 4,000 people that come in every day, and I can't see them anyway because of all the smoke going through the air while worship is going on. And the pastor's going to give me a really soft, easy message. He's never going to talk about conflict resolution. He's going to tell me to love them. That's the church we experience today. More, they, were, they would be devastated. They desired the community, and they'd be devastated if they got to step four with Jesus' model or step three of Paul's model. So in other words, when you get to Paul's model, two strikes and you're out, if someone comes to you and says you're creating division, they would be like, oh, I'm sorry, let me stop creating division. Let me change how I'm acting because I don't want to be cut off from you. Versus today's world, you just accuse me, I'll just go ahead and cut myself off. That is a reality. So we have to understand, what is our goal out of all this? So next week, we're going to dive into how we treat the person, how we treat them in conflict, how we treat them in resolution, how we treat them in sending them out if they don't want to resolve. And it's kind of funny because I've gone from not liking sermon series to now I've got two open at one time. It's a good place. We will eventually come back and finish our series on did Jesus go through that too? But we're going to get through this, I think, next week, but I'll take as long as it takes because I don't think there's anything more important than we can discuss right now in our world. In our situation, then understanding how to handle this stuff correctly if someone sins against you, Matthew 18 model, go privately. They don't listen, take a witness. They don't listen, take it to the church. They don't listen, treat them like a pagan. But remember that Jesus is with you through all of that. If someone creates division among the church, warn them once, warn them again, then have nothing to do with them. It didn't say go talk about them, go spread gossip and rumors about them. Just have nothing to do with them. Just let it go. But if you listen to this today and you don't listen to next week's, it's not going to be a complete picture. Next week is crucial to rounding this out. So if you need to confront someone, wait till the week at, wait till you hear next week. Like if you've heard this, and you're like, yeah, there's 17 people I need to go confront one on one. Hey, hang on. Pump the brakes on that. You've dealt with it this long. Hold it till the next week, okay? Let us get through next week, then go deal with it. Because I want to make sure when you go seek reconciliation, you're doing it with the right instructions there. Does that make sense? I don't want, this is not me challenging everyone to go out and start chopping off heads this week, okay? Figuratively, Javier, not literally, okay? We're going to dig into Scripture about how to treat people that hurt us. We're going to dig into Scripture about how to treat people that are active in sin. We're going to dig into Scripture about what to do as believers to help those who are struggling in sin. So this week is to lay the foundation on how to do it. Next week is to lay the foundation on how to treat them while we're doing it. I'm going to say that again just to make sure I said that correct. This week is to lay the foundation on how, the model. Next week is to lay the foundation on how to treat them while we do the model. Does that make sense? Father, thank you for giving it to us in black and white. Thank you that Jesus is so clear on how easy this model is. Thank you that Paul was so clear on how easy that model is for the church. But Father, help convict us to follow the models. So many things in Scripture are laid out so easily, and we just don't do it. And then we question you on why it's not working out. So, Father, help each of us, me included, all of us, to be challenged by this, to evaluate, 
are we handling this correctly? Not to live in guilt and shame of the past if we haven't, to see this as a learning, kind of a turning point. We've learned, and now we will handle it from this point forward. We'll put a stake in the sand today, and from this point forward, we will handle our conflicts biblically. So, Father, help give us the courage to desire to do it, and help give us the um, self-control through your Holy Spirit to not go blast somebody when we're supposed to walk with them lovingly. Again, Lord, I just thank you that you give it to us so simple in Scripture. Help our pride to get out of the way and help us to walk through it. In Jesus' holy name, amen.